Dear students, welcome to third semester English Common Course class. In this class, we are going to look onto the paper Signatures Expressing the Self. So, before moving to the class, let's have a brief introduction about this paper. So, Signatures Expressing the Self is an interesting collection of personal narratives. So the book is divided into three modules. The first module, entitled Autobiographical Writings and Memoirs, include the writings of Pablo Miruda and Janet Armstrong. Module 2, Speeches and Testimonies, is an inspiring blend of the narratives of the actor, chaplain, dramatist, painter, poet, Janus Marie Kitani and the disturbing voices of Chernobyl. So the na last module consists of diaries and letters that reveal the heartbreaking experiences of Anne Frank, Adrian Moore and the mother of enter cell phone victims in Kasaraka district in Kerala. So dear students, Hope these valuable works will enlighten your mind and enrich your knowledge. Wish you a joyful reading experience. So let's move on to first work that is excerpts from memoirs by Pablo Neruda. So let's see a short biography of Pablo Neruda. So, the internationally acclaimed Latin American poet was born in the year 1904 in Chile. In 1924, he published the anonymously popular 20 love poems and songs of despair. In 1971, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Poetry. So, he died in the year 1973. So Neruda is so proud of the language that inherited according to him from the brave Spanish conquerors of Mexico and Peru. So in this small excerpt he brings the memories of his great aunt and sisters who struggled to build up a civilized culture amidst of all these struggles they paid special attention to literature and arts. Luminous words were left here. He believes that the words are the gift from the great ancestors. So, a word, talking about a word, a word can even crush you, thrush you and even it can kill you. So, a word is powerful to give you life by itself. So let me quote, a comma can kill a man, unquote. Yes, of course, a word give you life and kill you at the same time. So that's ab all about this work. I hope you understood this work. Okay then. We shall move on to the next chapter that is Pilgrim at Tinder Creek by Annie Dillard. So Dillard is an American poet and naturalist. She was born on April 1945 in Pennsylvania, US. Inspired by the writings of writers like Henry David Thoreau and Walt Whitman, she writes compressed lyric poetry and prose. So she is a naturalist, theologian, collagist and a singer. Her major works are Tickets for a Prayer Wheel, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek and American Childhood. An American Childhood is her autobiography. So this book deals the narrator's explore, explorations near her home and various contemplations on nature and life. The title 
refers to Tinker Creek which is outside Ronick and Virginia's the Blue Ridge Mountains. She began writing Pilgrim in the spring of 1973 using her personal journals as inspirations so separated into four sections that signify each of the season the narrative takes uh, place over the period of one year. In this work, she looks at the marvels of nature and searches for God. She is undertaking a pilgrimage into nature and observes nature with a microscopic eye. This book portrays the personal experiences of Dillard during a whole year in her neighborhood in Tinker Creek. So this is all about this uh, work. What does the author tries to say is that the beauty of nature, how this nature is, how the nature is so artfully or so bravely created or crafted by the creator himself. So when we observe this nature with a microscopic eye, we could see or uh, we could see many beautiful things as well. We also can study many more things that we study from our books or from our studies. So that's all about this work. I hope you enjoyed and understood this work. Yes. So we shall move to the next chapter that is I Stand With You Against the Disorder by Janet Armstrong. So let's see her short biography. Armstrong, an organican writer, indigenous civil rights activist and an educationalist was born in 1948 on Okanagan reserve in British Columbia. So Armstrong is the first native woman naturalist from Canada. She is a powerful spokesperson for indigenous people's rights. So Armstrong has written about creativity, education, ecology and indigenousness. There are two novels to her credit. That is 1985 which is her first and most famous novel and uh, Whispering Shadows uh, also published. Uh, she, uh, she has an anthology of poems uh, titled Breath Traits in 1991. All My Relations, an anthology of contemporary Canadian native fiction, is a collection of her short stories and children's literature. I Stand With You Against Disorder is an article by Armstrong, appeared in Years Magazine. .org. On November 2005, it was adapted from another book, namely Paradigm's War, Indigenous People's Resistance to Economic Globalization. In this article, Armstrong deals with a people's resistance to economic globalization. Here, she deals with the consequences of economic globalization also points out to the issues such as threat of deposition, privatization and exploitation of resources. So uh, Janet begins the essay by introducing herself to the readers. The Okanagan native tribes belong to the northern part of British Columbia. The Okanagan tribes have a deep connection with environment and to the earth. Then she talks about the educational practices which makes them 
so much disciplined. So the Okanikins are taught that each individual is a social animal. So this is something very important. So whenever we consider that each individual is a social animal or each individual has his or, or her own individuality, then there is something called the harmony. Whenever we doesn't consider that uh, individuals are social animals or they have their own rights or individuality, people uh, become so aggressive, they encroach others' rights, others' uh, opportunities, all those things. So this is all about this work. Uh, I hope you understood and enjoyed this work. Okay then. So students, we are moving to the last work of module 1. That is, When I Was Growing Up by Nellie Vaughan. So a short biography of Nellie Vaughan, the daughter of Chinese immigrants. Nellie Vaughan was born in California on September 19. 34 during the Second World War. So Japanese Americans were evacuated to concentration camps since Japan had bombarded America's naval base at Pearl Harbor. It had a fearful and painful impact on Wong's family where they were considered as Japanese. Uh, so she published, Wong published her first book of poetry, Dreams, in Harrison Railroad Park by Kelsey Street Press. Her anthology of poetry includes The Death of Long Steam Lady, Stolen Moments and Breakfast, Dinner, Lunch. So she addressed issues such as feminism, immigration and identity through her poems. She was an advocate of revolutionary feminism and believed that women are not a mere victim on the earth instead they should fly with colors. So about the poem. When I was growing up is an autobiographical poem which was published in 1873. In this poem, one emphasizes on the identity crisis experienced by the Asian Americans and thus it depicts the history of the poet and her family. The poem is composed in past tense at the outset of the poem. The speaker describes her uh, desperation in a society that celebrates white beauty. When she grew up, she realized that it was white people who appeared in movies, magazines and they were elevated as the so-called uh, desirable women. It signifies that how the popular culture in America has cultivated these ideas of beauty by creating a wrong notion of being white. The speaker narrates how she was trying to be adapted to the western language and culture. She met white girls who wore imported cotton dresses and thought that she too should have these fortunes. When she grew up, she longed for the American food and style. The word, uh, the word hunger shows the intensity of her desire to imitate American white lifestyle. She began to hate 
yellow men and she felt ashamed of being with them and their acts were considered as cultureless when she grew up she would ask about her nationality and that made an identity crisis in her she felt that her dark skin was dirty and tried to wash it away so she says i could not shed my skin in the grey water uncooked she swore she would run away from somewhere and occupied with yellow people she concludes this poem with a note of self realization about her identity she reconciles herself with her chinese american identity there by dismantling the stereotype of the western beauty cult so in this poem one very well depicts the stereotypical mentality or the stereotypical viewpoint of the world by itself how they see or how they view women in large in that sense itself they distinguish between the white and the colored people this is what is very specifically said in this poem i hope you understood this poem okay then students we are moving to module 2 that is speeches and testimonies so a brief introduction of this module this module introduces two modes of communication namely speeches and testimonies so let's see what they are so a speech a speech is a mode of spoken communication addressed to an audience the content of the speech will be universal in nature the purpose of a speech is to inspire the audience and make them think the history of public speaking or oration can be traced to ancient greek so important elements of a speech are tone and sound of the speaker gestures and body language of the speaker humor and vocabulary so in this module we have two speeches one is an excerpt from the film the great dictator by charlie chaplin and the other art truth and politics the nobel prize acceptance speech by harold pinter so let's move on to the chapter that is final speech from the great dictator charlie chaplin so let's have a short biography of the author so charlie chaplin was born on 1889 ah uh, he was an english comedian actor producer and director of silent films his last film the great dictator is the only talking film which he has acted directed and produced most of his films are satires of the socio political conditions of his times his uh, characters portrayed the anxieties of common man in the industrial society with humor and pathos so some of his noted films are the gold rush then limelight then city lights then modern times and the great dictator so let's see something about the film the great dictator so the great dictator is a comedy written acted and produced by charlie chaplin in 1940 so the film is the first non silent film of chaplin 
It is a political satire condemning Hitler and the fascist regime in Germany during World War II. So let's have a brief of the text. So Chaplin's speech is addressed to the soldiers in the film. He begins the speech by saying uh, to the crowd that he does not want to become an emperor or uh, a conqueror or not to become either anyone but only to help people. He emphasizes the ability of humanity to live in harmony regardless of color, race and gender. He then talks about how greed has destroyed human souls and divided the world with hatred. He addresses the entire sections of people who are suffering and asks them not to uh, be disappointed or not to get despised because the present situation will change and peace will be restored when people fight collectively against these dividing forces. He asserts the strength of democracy and the belief in collective strength of the people. He uh, quotes from the 17th chapter of St. Luke from the Holy Bible that, let me quote, Kingdom of God is within man, unquote. Yes, of course, everyone has a capacity to create happiness and make this life peaceful. Yes, uh, from this quotation from the Holy Bible, one can understand that happiness, the quality of happiness, the quality of peace making, all those things are inherent in, uh, in, in the minds or in the heart of mankind itself. So, we ourselves are making this world evil or we ourselves are making this world better. So, the speech ends with the exaltation in order to save democracy uh, they should unite and fight for a world devoid of greed and hatred devoid of barriers and a world of reason where science and progress makes human life more better and happy so this is all about this speech and this chapter hope you enjoyed it well okay then since we are moving to the next chapter that is art truth and politics so this is a nobel prize acceptance speech given by harold pinter so a short biography of pinter pinter is a well-known British playwrights of the 20th century. He began his career in the theatre with the play The Room, 1957. He is well known for his plays The Birthday Party. So he wrote plays for radio, television and film. He also adapted others' works uh, for screen such as the Servant, The Go uh, Dash Between, The French Lieutenant's Woman, The Trial are some of his famous adaptations. Influenced by Samuel Beckett's uh, works, Pinder delineates and, uh, and the confusions and anxieties of a post-war society in Europe. So in this speech, Pinter criticizes the US government war policies and its attempt to become, uh, let me quote, the big brother. So in the, in the end, he reminds the audience the importance to fight for a 
war free peaceful society for the future generations to come so he begins the speech by distinguishing between the real and the unreal the true and the false in the realm of art the idea of a real truth cannot be found in dramatic art the function of language is ambiguous in art for political theater the situation is different it has to be objective and should not take the form of a sermon but in a dramatic form it should represent multiple perspectives so the dramatist should be ready to present a number of perspective and keep away his own prejudices so he uh, then deviates to some of the contemporary political events to discuss the line between true and false he mentions how the war on iraq was initiated on the basis of an allegation that saddam hussein possessed dangerous weapons similarly it was alleged that iraq shared the responsibility with al qaeda for 9 bar 11 attack but later it became clear that these two were not true he then discusses the history of war crimes committed by the us he says direct attacks on countries has never been the policy of the us instead it preferred low and in intensity conflict which meant a slow and gradual intervention there was never any mention of the war crimes and atrocities of the us he raises questions regarding the collective conscience against these atrocities he then mentions about the violations done by the us at guantanamo bay prison so the case of iraq invasion is a clear example of violations and the number of deaths of iraqi let me repeat iraqi civilians were never counted in this speech pinda vehemently criticizes the us government's foreign policy from second world war onwards till the contemporary period he also points how the us becomes a threat to every nation with a history of bloodshed and violence that it has committed in these years he ends the speech by explaining the role of the writer in these political turmoil and how vulnerable an artist in these situations he argues that as a citizen it is their responsibility to define the real truth of their society the great intellectual determination such a responsibility is required to restore the dignity of man which is being violated in these war crimes so this is all about this speech i hope you understood this speech okay then now let's move on to testimony so a testimony refers to the affirmation proving a fact in the context of law it may be written or oral form it refers to the declaration of a witness or a victim communicated orally or in written form in the field of literature the idea of testimony is significant why expressing the experiences of trauma so in the section we have two testimonies 
uh, one is an excerpt from the book Voices from Chernobyl the oral history of nuclear disaster and the other is a poem Breaking the Silence by Janice Merkitan so moving into the text that is Voices from Chernobyl the oral history of a nuclear disaster so about the author Svetlana Alexovich a Belarusian journalist and writer won the, the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2015 her works are known for polyphonic writings a monument to suffering and courage in our times she is well known for the book Voices from Chernobyl the, the oral history of a nuclear disaster which captured the voices of ordinary people affected by the destructive nuclear explosion at Chernobyl. So, uh, Alexevich interviewed hundreds of victims of the disaster and documented the personal account of the incident and their life after the explosion. So the section here titled A Solitary Human Voice is an edited version of the excerpt recorded by Alexovich. So the narrator is Ignatenko, the pregnant wife of the firefighter Waisley. So his wife narrates the incident from the night of the accident till the slow death of her husband. They were newly wet and were staying in the dormitory of the fire station at the time of the accident. So at night she woke up hearing a noise. Her husband informed her that fire had broken out at the reactor and had been called for duty. So this was the incident when f fire broke out at, at the reactor everyone were called out for duty and as well the narrator's husband has been uh, also called for duty so next day she found her husband in the hospital his body was so swollen and puffed up the doctors told her that he was exposed to radiation and she should not go near him or touch touch him as she was pregnant. So as spending days in the hospital, his body began to change. Her husband died after two weeks. So doctors said that he became a radioactive object and the body reacted uh, sorry, the body regenerated so badly. So after his death, the body was not handed to the relatives but buried in Moscow with special care. So how, think how terrible and horrible the situation is when our near and dear ones die, uh, when we are not able to receive their body and give them a, a, a reasonable burial it will be so uh, so sad or so horrible in nature so two months later uh, she gave birth to a baby girl so this child also uh, died due to birth defects so this is all about the text so here in this text we could see a real in incident which took uh, in the world so this is because of uh, some uh, some uh, mistakes where uh, people did not give more attention or something uh, something other than that. So uh, those people who lived around it or those creatures which surrounded around it suffered the most. So I hope you understood this text well. Okay then. So students, we are moving to the next work that is Breaking the Silence by 
Janus Murikitani. So the poem is a testimony against the injustices experienced by Japanese Americans when they were put into internment in uh, America during World War II. T so the testimony is written in the form of a poem where the poet narrates the accounts of her mother before the commission on wartime relocation and internment of Japanese American civilians. Murakitani is a Japanese American poet, dancer and an activist well known for her anti-war campaigns and her works against institutional racism and the exploitation of women and the poor. Her collection of poetry include Awake in the River, Shedding Silence, We the Dangerous New. So the poem deals this poem that is the that is breaking the silence deals with the experiences of Japanese American when they were put into internment during World War II. So let's have a brief of this poem. So the poet begins by saying that her mother went to testify after 40 years before the commission on wartime relocation and internment of Japanese American. Her mother narrated how their property was confiscated. She explains how her mother's silence was broken and how words were peeling off from her body. So all her work over the years were silenced when they were asked to give up everything. She learns that the color of the skin betrayed them. For her mother, the silence of the crippled tongue and the muted eyelashes speak more powerfully about their subdued existence. After 40 years, she is breaking her silence before the commission to claim her past. She speaks for those who have suffered in silence. They would speak about the humiliations they had suffered about war crimes committed by the government. So about their longings and hopes. So she says how they have become clear like a glass when they began to speak about their wounds and tears. They began to recognize themselves and the noises within them. So the poet ends by saying that after breaking the silence, they are not scared and they also feel that their language is so beautiful. So uh, uh, this is all about this poem. So I think this is a very beautiful poem where she writes from her personal experiences about wartime internment and wartime atrocities faced by the Japanese Americans. So the title itself says very significantly speaks uh, the content of the poem that is breaking the silence. So that's all about this uh, poem. Okay then. Students, we are moving to the third module that is diary entries and letters. So let's see the brief of this module. This module introduces two of the important forms of personal narratives. They are diary entries and letters. Here we are exploring the significance of these two forms in the world of literature. First, let's discuss what a diary entry is. So, a diary is a form of autobiographical writing. It can be defined as a day-to-day -day record of events in one's life written for personal satisfaction with little or no thought of 
publication. Here we have two diary entries. So the diary of a young girl and the secret diary of Adrian Moore. So let's move on to the work. The diary of a young girl and Frank. So introduction. Anne Frank was born in the year 1929. Uh, she was a German Jewish girl who was a victim of the anti-Jewish law of Nazi Germany in 1933 when the Nazis assented to power all the conditions prevailing there changed and animosity towards the Jews multiplied so the Franks and many other German Jews left Frankfurt for Amsterdam for it has been considered a safe haven for religious minority. So in May 1940, the Germans invaded the Netherlands. Uh, so as situation worsened, they moved to a hiding place uh, where they lived for two years until they were betrayed uh, in the year 1944. They were arrested on the 4th of August 1944. So about the diary. So Anne Frank kept a diary from June 1942 to August 1st 1944. So Anne decided to publish a book based on her diary once the war ended. So the last entry was dated August 1st, 1944. On August 4th, 1944, uh, eight people hiding in the secret annex were arrested. So let's have an outline of the uh, diary entry. Here we are analyzing two of the many entries in her diary. The first one discussed as a one on Monday 22nd May 1944. So she begins the entry by addressing her fictitious friend Kitty. She expresses her concern for fellow Jewish community. She explains the terror that was being spread due to anti-semitism with the regime of Hitler uh, in Germany. Jews emigrated to other places like Holland, Poland, etc. There is a mention about the attitude of the Dutch in this diary. She is on the hope that someday this hatred uh, towards the Jews will end and uh, the Dutch will be considerate and noble towards them. So if that terrible uh, threat to come uh, become true, it will lead to a situation where the minority of Jews uh, would have to leave Holland. So in the end, she shows her love for Holland and she wishes it would become her fatherland and continues with that hope. So the next entry is on Thursday 25th May 1944. Two days later she began the diary uh, afresh. She narrates the incident where the vegetable man was picked up for helping two Jews to hide in his house. This became a terrible situation for the man and the Jews who are on the verge of fall. So she also mentions the atrocities caused against the Jews. So at the end she states that it's better to remain hungry than being discovered by them. So a very 
a very powerful statement because hunger is something which uh, no one likes to face because uh, we don't uh, like to get uh, like to be in a state of uh, in a hungry state we all want food all those things so she's telling that even uh, she's telling that even if i we are hungry it doesn't matter rather than being caught by these people so the, that's all about this diary so i hope you understood this okay then so students let us discuss the second diary entry in this section this is a novel written in the form of a diary the diary through the perspective of Adrian Moore the most adolescent hero in English literature before Harry Potter so the secret diary of Adrian Moore aged 33/4 so about Sue Townsend so Her full name is Susan Lillian Sue Thompson. She is Britain's most celebrated comic writer, novelist, playwright and journalist. She wrote repeatedly about the about the ways ordinary lives are disfigured by politics. So to Sue Thompson was born in the year 1946 so her first play uh got the themes television playwright award she is best known for creating the character Adrian Mole and the fictional diaries of Adrian Mole a character who was allowed to grow up from adolescent to the middle age so the glory of mol is his inability to see the funny side of his self etc so let's have an outline of the work uh so the first part of the diary entries are some of the days in january here he expresses his concern and anxiety being a teenager so the first entry is on wednesday 14 january he writes about his first day joining the library he got two books that is care of the skin origin of species and the other was pride and prejudice next he mentions about a new girl in his class she was pandora so but uh, she preferred to be addressed as a uh, as box so the next entry was on saturday january 17th here he writes about dr that is dr taylor his physician to whom he shares all his worries so another entry was on tuesday january 20th titled full moon he talks about his mother who was searching for a job so in the later entry on thursday january 22nd adrian talks about his mother's interview for a job the next entry is on sunday january 25th titled third after epiphany so in this he thought of pantora his lost love so this is all about the first part so let's move on to the second part so it contains some of the entries in february and march and this the first entry is on saturday february 7th he talks about the dispute between his mother and father for hours so the next entry was on monday march 2nd here he writes about his mother how 
she introduced the matter of their divorce to him. So later entry was on Sunday, March 8th, titled First in Lent. So another entry was on Monday, March 9th, which was titled Commonwealth Day. He talks about the household entrusted to him before going to school and after returning from school. So another entry was on Wednesday, March 18th. He discussed his parents' critical stage of divorce. So in the last part of the diary are some of the dates in September, November and January. So the first is on September 14th. It was again titled Full Moon. So the next entry is on Friday, November 13th. He talks about his girlfriend Pandora. So the last entry is on Sunday, January 10th. It was first after Epiphany. So on the whole, all these entries give us a clear impression about a teenager who, who is obsessed with her skin, who is concerned about his lost love and who is hurt by his parents. He considers himself to be an intellectual. As we know, Adrian is the main character and through us his eyes we see the whole events with a humorous tinge. So students let us move on to letters. So another form to explore in this module is letters. So a letter is a message written to another pertaining to some matter. So here we are talking about literary letters. So here we have two letters the first one is letters from the mothers of Nanjam Parambu to the Supreme Court, which deals with a serious social issue. So the other one is letter to Adolf Hitler, which is a pol political letter dealing with political strategies and methods. So let's see them. So letters from the mothers of Nanjam Parambu to the Supreme Court. So let's see something about the author. M. A. Rahman is a retired professor who was well known as an activist, critic and filmmaker. He has been at the forefront for echo movement against Endosulfan. He is a recipient of the Oracural Award. In addition to this, his documentary, Bashir, the man, won the National Award for the Best Biographical Documentary. So his films were screened at international uh, film festivals in London, Paris, Taiwan, etc. So let's move on to the letter. Letters from Mothers is an affidavit submitted to Supreme Court on behalf of tens and hundreds of victims who are struggling with a terrible misery caused by the poisonous chemical and to sulfon and the form of deadly diseases. So it was based on a news item that appeared in the Matrubumi Daily of 9th May 2011 with a headline, let me quote, Newborn infant of entosulfan afflicted family dies, unquote. So the child who dies was born to Mamada and Narayanan of Adu. The child had a premature death at Kasaragod General Hospital. He did not have eyes. Their second son, Naveen, a nine-year-old boy, was included in the list of endosulfan victims. 
so they are another son nagesh who was 4 years old was also affected so in her third delivery mamada gave birth to twin where both the children died so another victim was from nancham parambu uh place called nancham parambu so when we consider navi he is a child who survives with both his legs crippled he is even blind so he receives a pension of rupees 2000 every month so spraying and to some farm was stopped in the year 2000 so in 2002 the documentary let me put a uh, paradise for the dying and quote was shot in nancham parambu there they met a man named achudan maniyani a plantation laborer his job was to mix into sulfur he has been doing this for almost 10 years and has lost his health completely an epidemiology study was conducted for icmr under the community health department of kalagat medical college as per the direction of supreme court they discovered high levels of into sulfur from the blood samples of of people from nancham parambu apart from this the kerala state council for science technology and environment k s c s t e in its study conducted tests to measure into sulfur levels in water and soil in the area discovered into sulfur particles in nancham parambu so the presence of into sulfur even after 10 years have shocked the scientists so on the whole now the villages of kasaragod have become the setting for so let me uh, repeat once again so the villages of kasaragod has become the setting for the macabre dance of it so this is all about this letter hope you enjoyed and understood this one okay then students we are moving to the last work of this module as well as this paper that is letter to adolf hitler by mahatma gandhi so something about the author mahatma gandhi was a prolific writer and a significant political leader he employed non-violent principles and peace full disobedience in his freedom struggle so mohandas karamchand gandhi was born on 2nd october 1869 in porbandar gujarat so gandhi studied law from london after his return to india from south africa where he was practicing as a lawyer in 1950 he organized peasants farmers and urban laborers to protest against excessive land tax and discrimination so assuming leadership of the indian national congress in 1921 he led nationwide campaign for various social causes and for achieving swaraj which means self rule so gandhi was assassinated on 30th of january 1948 so his major literary works include hind swaraj and Uh, one of the other is his autobiographical work that is an autobiography the story of my experiments with truth
Again, let's see something about Hitler. A short biography of Hitler. So, Adolf Hitler, a contemporary of Gandhi, was the Chancellor of Germany from 1933 to 1945. He initiated the Second World War in Europe with the invasion of Poland in September 1939. His autobiography is named My Struggle, promoted pan-Germanism, anti-Semitism and anti-communism. So followed by the defeat in the Second World War, he committed suicide. So let's have a brief to the text or to the letter. The prescribed letter was written on December 24, 1940. Gandhi begins the letter by addressing Hitler as a dear friend. He affirms Hitler that he has no enmity towards Hitler and that his business in life is uh, for last 33 years is to create friendship universally by befriending mankind regardless of race, color or creed. Gandhi states that there is no doubt regarding Hitler's bravery or devotion to his fatherland and that no one believed to be a monster as described by his challengers. So humiliation of Czechoslovakia, the rape of Poland and the swallowing of Denmark are virtuous acts for Hitler while for Gandhi they are acts degrading humanity. Gandhi also points out that their revolt against British rule is unarmed and also by using non-violent non-cooperation. He also states that rulers may capture their land and bodies but not their souls. He is a very brave or a very strong laid statement that is Rulers can capture or may capture the land and the bodies of the people but not their souls. Yes, even though they can capture the land, those facilities, those natural resources, everything, but they are not able to capture the souls of the people. So, towards the end, Gandhi requests Hitler to stop war in the name of humanity. Gandhi ends his letter on a pos positive, hopeful note stating himself as Hitler's sincere friend. So this is all about this work. Hope you all uh, enjoyed and understood this letter well. So this is all about this whole paper. So wishing you once again a very joyful reading experience. So thank you all.